All right. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and start bringing it back now. Um, hopefully you, you kind of had some cool things going on during that thought experiment. Um, but before we get into Luke chapter 19, which is our text that we're going to be in today, we're actually uh, off of the book of John just for two weeks here for Palm Sunday and Easter. Um, let's go ahead and pray for this time. Uh, this is for my heart. This is for your heart. And this is just to remind ourselves that it's not about some exercise of opening a book and, and teaching you as if this was a textbook. This is about the real living God who, who wants a relationship with us and that there's a Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. And that might sound weird to you if you're, you're a new believer or you're not a believer at all, but, but this is the truth that God has revealed himself to us in a powerful way. So we, we want to make sure that he is first and foremost about this, that it's not just some intellectual thing, that we are worshiping God in spirit and in truth. So would you join me as we pray for this time this morning? God, we pray right now for your anointing in this place this place being each and every home throughout the Los Angeles area, New York, Seattle, wherever people are tuning in to watch what you are doing here at the Image Church, Lord. We just pray for your presence. We pray for your comfort. We pray for your supernatural understanding, Lord, that as we open your word, that the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit would allow us to to read this and understand it the way that you intended for us to understand it, Lord that we would not be led astray by false doctrines or false teachings, Lord, but that your word would be proclaimed here and now this morning, Lord, and that we would apply that word to our lives, that we would walk away from this feeling like we are equipped and have the tools to better follow you, to better be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, and to better tell people the good news of the gospel of Jesus as we go out, Lord. God, we thank you for this time and for this place and for the ability to gather online. We thank you in your holy, precious name. Amen. Well, you guys, uh, the title of today's sermon has, has a lot to do with that question that I just asked you. And the title is, You Can't Always Get What You Want. But in the words of the great theologians, the Rolling Stones, if you try sometimes, you can get what you need. No, no, that's not really what we're going. But you can't always get what you want. And not just can you not get what you want, you really shouldn't always get what you want. This is something that we understand with with our children. I I know my parents made sure that I didn't always get what I wanted because they knew it wouldn't be good for me. In fact, even now with my niece or even with my mom and dad sometimes, um, whenever I ask for something that's a clear no, I I will hear them begin to sing that Rolling Stones song, you can't always get what you want. I don't know if any of you kids out there have related to that. My niece hates it whenever we sing that song to her um, when she wants a cookie or something like that. Um, but, But the truth is you can't always get what you want and you shouldn't always get what you want. There was a movie in 2003 and it's been a long time since I watched this movie, so I am not condoning this movie. In fact, there's probably some inappropriate content, so do not go and watch this movie. Um, but, But it was called Bruce Almighty. And Jim Carrey, um, his character basically gets the power of God over this little city in New York. So he actually hears people's prayers. He, he can control the weather. He can part traffic. He can do all sorts of crazy things. And just in this one city, he starts to get these prayer requests of people flooding into his mind. And he's like, I don't, I don't know what to do with these. So he decides to, to put it into email form. So he, he opens his inbox and there's a million unread prayers. And he tries to answer them as quickly as he can. He's like, all right, prob- I probably made a dent in this. And he goes and looks, and there's three million. They, just, they increased two more million prayers. And he's like, I, I don't have time for this. I'm not going to have a life if all I do is sit here answering people's prayers. So he, he actually replies to all and just says, yes. He answers everybody's prayer, yes. And kind of a havoc starts to go in this little town in Buffalo, New York. 17,000 people win the lottery the next day. Um, all these sports teams end up tying in these competitions because everyone's prayers are getting answered. And, and it turns out that's not actually what was best. You see, we pray to God. And if he were to say yes to a lot of our prayers, there'd be some pretty dire consequences. Because the truth is that our heart is wicked above all things. And and some of the things we pray for aren't what's best for us. And they're definitely not what's best for the world. You see, we oftentimes will pray from a place of selfishness. We'll we'll, we'll pray from all sorts of kind of wicked places. And in the end, God, in his divine providence, in his knowledge of knowing what is best for the world, will say no. And we might not get that because we are his children, 
but he is our good father who knows when to say yes and knows when to say no and knows what is best for his children. If we as parents know that saying yes all the time is not what's best for our children, then we should trust that our heavenly father knows what's best and will not always say yes to us, his children. So as we get into our text, go ahead and open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. We're going to be in verses 28 through 44 today. This is the story of Palm Sunday. As I mentioned, we've been in a series through the Gospel of John, which I believe right now we're going to hop back into the week after Easter. Um, But right now we want to focus in on Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday and just really kind of celebrate this time together as a church, as a body of believers, uh, as part of the global church. And this is Jesus' final week. Palm Sunday is Jesus' triumphal entrance into Jerusalem in his final week of life. And there's actually a lot going on here because there's this celebration, and and the celebration is rightful, but it's actually made by people whose hearts might not be in the right place. You see, people can say something that's true without actually believing that it's true or or really understanding why it's true. We, we, We saw this last week as we looked at Caiaphas saying, it's better for one man to die than a whole nation to suffer. But but he didn't even realize what he was saying, but he was absolutely right that he prophesied that Jesus would come and one man would die so that all might be saved through Jesus. You see, his words were right, but but he didn't understand what was going on behind them. And that's kind of what you see in this Palm Sunday message. You see, he's coming in. They have palm fronds because they see Jesus coming in and and he's the promised Messiah. They actually believe he is going to be this political warrior king who is actually going to now take over Rome and and establish the Jewish people in charge of everything. That he's going to bring these legions of armies to destroy this nation that had been oppressing them for so long. So they're laying down palm fronds like you would when, when someone comes home from war. They're, they're ready to follow this guy to the ends of the earth. So long as he's who they think he is. So long as they, they, they fit in his box of what the Messiah was supposed to be. Without really any concern over if he really is the Messiah, who he is is who he is. Your misunderstanding doesn't mean that he should now shift to fit into your box. And that's why there's this kind of bittersweet. What they were saying was correct. Jesus Christ is worthy of all glory and honor and praise. But these people, five days later, are going to be the same crowd that votes to release Barabbas. The same people who who, who thought that this was the Messiah, who who said, Hosanna to the King of David. Hosanna to the Son of David, the King of Kings. Hosanna. They're they're now going to be the reason that he is hung on the cross, that he's killed. You see, these people were saying the right things, but but they actually came up against a, a Messiah who was different than they were expecting. And instead of them kind of shifting their expectations. Instead, they put him to death. So um, the the kind of main thought that that we're going to show you guys today is that the more we know God, the more we'll learn about ourselves, and the less we will desire our will above God's will. The, The more we will learn about our, the more we know God, the more we will learn about ourselves, and the less we will desire our will above God's will. So uh, what that means is that in this whole exercise, um, we really don't know ourselves as well as God knows us. So the more that we know our creator, the more that we now know about ourselves, and the more we realize we are wicked and he is good, that we are just punks and that he is the creator of all things, we will then begin to say, you know what? Not, Not my will, but your will be done, God. You you know, I really don't want to get my way all the time because my way has led to some pretty disastrous outcomes. Instead, God, I I want your way. So with that in mind, I want to go ahead and read our text today. Like I said, in your Bibles, Luke 19, 28 through 44 is where we're going to be. Luke writes, and when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, 
where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying our colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, even the rocks would cry out. And when he drew near, he saw the city, and he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that would make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and, and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children with you and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You see, see this was Jesus' response. They had gone into this city and he, he saw all the praise, but, but knowing their hearts, he, he knew that it was short-lived. He knew what was to come. And he knew that behind all those words and, and behind all that, there was, there was some real suffering. There was some real struggling that was going to happen. He knew that five days later, he was going to have to go to the cross to die for the sins of mankind. And he sees Jerusalem. He sees the nation of Israel. He sees God's chosen people. And he weeps and mourns knowing the devastation that is in their future because they, they didn't follow the way that God had laid things out. They didn't make known the, the things that would make for peace. They, they basically put Jesus to death. And all this led to some very unfortunate circumstances. And Jesus' heart broke and grieves for his people. There's three things that we learn about following Jesus from this crowd on Palm Sunday, declaring Hosanna to the King, uh, uh, Hosanna to the Son of David, Hosanna to the King. The first thing that we learn is that following Jesus won't always make sense. Following Jesus won't always make sense. Probably the, the biggest understanding of this is uh, he asked his disciples to go steal a colt, right? <laughs> not, not quite steal because they end up getting permission from the owners, but he's like, all right, I want you to go into that village. I, I want you to, to find that first colt that you see. No one's ever going to have sat on that colt. Untie it and bring it to me. And, and when the owners stop you, you're going to tell them uh, the Lord has need of it. That's crazy. I, I don't understand that. That doesn't make sense to me. But if you're following Jesus, it won't always make sense. But if he's worth following, then you walk in obedience. You see, that's why you have to be so careful and know the cost of discipleship before you take that step. Because there's a lot of people who aren't worth following. There's a lot of people in this world who we can follow right down the pit of despair. There are people in this world that we can follow into sinful lifestyles that will reap, wreak havoc on our lives. We can follow our own desires into a pit that will kill us time and time again. Or we can follow the one who is the light of the world, the one who actually created us and knows what is best for us. If we follow him, it might not always make sense, but it will always lead us to life and life abundant. And that's because God has a bigger plan. God has a bigger plan than you and I know. You see, there's more going on than what we know. And, and that's why it's so dangerous for us to, to, to say, God, why aren't you just saying yes to all my prayers? Don't you want me to be happy? Don't you want me to know all these different things? But, but God actually says, you know what? There's a bigger plan than just that. There's more going on. For, for, for a small instance, um, me and Kate got married on February 20th. And we selfishly prayed that it wouldn't rain. 
And well, we, we knew that God was in control and we had planned an outdoor ceremony and we kind of prepared for the worst case scenario if it did rain. But we really just, as a kind of a, God, would you help it not to rain so that we could save some money on this tent? And, and that would be great. But, but ultimately, God, not our will, but your will be done. You see, there's a lot to consider in that one simple prayer that it wouldn't rain. I, I didn't really think about this at the time, but, but there could have been a couple farmers who were praying for rain. There could have been a couple people who, who needed that rain, who, who had the exact opposite prayer of mine. And, and ultimately, it's okay to pray for the things that we want, but at the end of the day, to realize that what we want might not be what's best. And that God has the whole scope of everything. That God has the whole picture. And that surrender and following Jesus means trusting when he says no, that's a good thing. And if he says yes, that's the best thing. If he says wait, that's the best thing because it's about surrendering and following Jesus, even when it doesn't make sense. There's this humility that comes from realizing that we are not God. We are a created being, and the creator of all things has invited us into relationship with him. And with that comes some trust that what we don't see, he does see, and he's got it. And his promise through Jesus Christ is that he is for us and not against us, and that's good news. You see, when we start to understand who God is, it helps us understand who we are and, and it helps our prayers not be so much, God, give me everything I want and more becomes, God, give me everything that you want. Because what I want isn't great. And what you want for me is the best. It is for my good, it is for your glory. It is so much more than, than what I could kind of conjure up on my own. So the first thing, following Jesus won't always make sense. The second thing we learn about following Jesus from this passage is something that I actually see very commonly in the world. And that's following Jesus as long as he follows you isn't really following Jesus. Following Jesus as long as he follows you isn't really following Jesus. This might sound silly, but, but that's kind of what we do, isn't it? it it's kind of this, well, God, I, I, Jesus, I'll follow you as long as you're going the exact same way that I'm going. Yeah, Jesus, I will make you Lord, master, and ruler of my life as long as you fit in this box of what I think you should be and don't really ask me to do anything hard and I get to keep doing exactly what I want whenever I want. That sounds great. I'll follow you. That's not following him. That's following yourself. That's the worldly way of follow your innermost desires, follow, follow whatever you want, new age, all this stuff. That, that's not following Jesus and that's not surrender. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. So if you think you're going to get to heaven, if you think that you're going to get to God through yourself, you are sorely mistaken. I've seen this in the world, just like we see it in the crowd here, that they're willing to follow Jesus as long as he is this warrior king that is going to set them free exactly how they want them, him to set them free. As long as he's going to fight off the Roman legions and they get to be in a position of power and authority, then yeah, they'd follow him to the ends of the earth but they're not really following him. They're following this idea of him that they've created in their mind. You see, Jesus is Jesus regardless of what you believe. God is God regardless of who, who you think God is, and he has revealed himself to us through the person of Jesus Christ. But we don't get to recreate God in our own image. That is a false idol that must be torn down, and you will end up in a world of hurt if you are following your own selfish desires. Following Jesus only if he follows us, is not really following Jesus. It's kind of a funny story. When we were on our honeymoon, I don't know why I did this, but um, Kate had actually been to a lot of the different spots that we visited. So there were certain days where she had, not she said, you know what, today you're the tour guide. Take us where you want us to go. Um, I'll, I'll just follow you. It'll be fine. And then there was other days where I said, well, you've been here before, so go ahead and take the lead and I'll just follow you. You see, I told her I'd follow her, but I have this weird habit that I didn't even realize what it was. But whenever we would exit a door, I would just turn in whatever direction I felt like turning and just start walking. I wasn't the guide for that day. I wasn't the one who Kate was supposed to be following. I was supposed to be following her, yet somehow I, I had this kind of instinct. I just wanted to go this way, and, and she would constantly have to pull me back and say, hey, where are you going? I was like, I don't know, it's just this way. Oh, well, we're going this way. Oh, okay. And I would have to turn away. But the truth is that I wasn't really following her if I went my own way. There's another song for you. You can go your own way, but it doesn't mean that you're following the person that you're supposed to be following. It's a silly thing, but, but that's what we do with Jesus. 
We say, Jesus, I will follow you. I will follow you. I will follow you. Ooh, red pony. Ooh, shiny thing. And we get led astray to all sorts of devious places because we're not really following Jesus. We're not paying attention to the leading of the Holy Spirit. We're just following ourselves down rabbit holes that will lead us to a world of hurt. We need to stop praying that we would always get what we want and start praying that we might always get what he wants. You see, we, we try and recreate God in our own image. And, and then when our faith gets lost, we, we say, God, how could you do this? And God says, I, I wasn't anywhere in that. This faith that you had wasn't even really a, a faith at all. The, the pastor, Greg Laurie, says it this way, and this is a powerful statement. He, he said, there's all these people who say, when tragedy hits, I, I lost my faith. And his response to them is, is good. You needed to lose that faith. And they would say, I, I don't understand. What, what do you mean I needed to lose that faith? That, that, I didn't want to lose my faith, but, but when that tragedy hit, I, I lost, what do you mean I needed to lose that faith? And he says, the faith that cannot sustain you in crisis is not real faith at all. A, a faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. You see, if this faith was able to get knocked out from under your feet when crisis hit, then that wasn't the faith that comes from Jesus. That wasn't the faith and promise of peace in the midst of the storm that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that faith, that true faith that God gives you as a gift, salvation is a gift, that can't be taken away. When the storm hits, it causes you to rely more and more on him. I know it'll be hard sometimes and it might be shaky and it might be a struggle to obey. But sometimes that, that false faith, that faith that we think is in God when it's really in all sorts of things that we create, sometimes that needs to die. And we need to lose that faith to make room for the truth faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that no matter what happens, we have him and he is enough. Life or death, we have him and he is enough. Good test results or bad test results, we have Jesus and he is enough good things at home, bad things at home, good circumstances, quarantine, uh, out and about, whatever it is, we have Jesus and he is enough. So there is no storm that can shake your faith because you can't shake Jesus. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was in the beginning with God. We just studied John in that. Jesus is unchanging. And as long as he is unchanged and your faith is truly in him, then that faith can't be shaken. But if your faith is in the things of this world, if you came to Christ because someone told you that you would have a nice house and then your house gets taken away, guess what? That false faith gets taken away as well because your faith was never in Jesus. Your faith was in a house. Your faith was in material possessions. It, whatever it is, it wasn't the real faith that comes from God. But point number three, following Jesus will lead us into peace. Following Jesus will lead us into peace. The Bible talks about the peace that passes understanding. For the believer in this room who's experienced that, it is unlike anything else that in the midst of whatever storm might be going through, that true faith, that unshakable faith, it leads you to peace. This peace that even though there's so much that you can't control, there is someone who can control it, and his name is Jesus, and he is still on the throne. That peace that passes understanding, it comes from following Jesus. This is the, the peace that he, he wept over the loss of for the nation of Israel, saying, man, would they have just turned away and just accepted that free gift of salvation and known what it meant to walk in the peace that passes understanding. That is what God is offering you and that's what he's offering me and that's what he has offered all of us. That if we would just follow him, we can enter into his rest and his promises. We will never be good enough to earn our salvation. We won't. But Jesus laid it all out on the cross. And if we would just lay our sins at his feet and just allow God to work in our hearts, we, we can walk in that peace in the midst of pandemic and quarantine and, and all this craziness. We can walk in a peace that passes understanding. And you can start to see your prayer life really shape up. You see, back to our kind of theme for today, the more you understand about God, the more you know God, 
the more you're going to know yourself and the more you're actually not going to want your own heart's desires, you're going to want his desires. So you can't always get what you want. You shouldn't always get what you want. But, but if what you want is what God wants, you can get that. And that's going to be what's best. And that's what discipleship is. It is aligning our heart's desires. Our heart is leading us back to that life of sinfulness that God rescued us out of, but God is inviting us to the freedom with him that comes through Jesus Christ. And discipleship is the act of allowing our heart's desire to be more and more in tune with him, that we are being made more and more like Jesus Christ every day, that we are putting aside what we want and picking up our cross daily and following Jesus. And you'll start to see your prayer life begin to reflect it. Your prayers won't be selfish anymore. Your prayers won't be all these trivial, small things. You'll you'll start to pray for for the things that God prays for, or the things that God declares in his word. You'll start to pray for what Jesus prayed for, that the nations would come to him. You start to pray for the lost. You start to pray that God would use you you start to pray for work. Isn't that crazy? Pray, pray for work that God would use you for his kingdom work. And your prayers are no longer about your own selfish desires. They are about the desires of God. And it leads you into this peace that is unmistakably from God. A peace that passes understanding. Not a spirit of fear or timidity or anxiety. A spirit of peace. Would you join me as we pray? God, we thank you for this time. I I pray that this was fruitful. I pray that it was helpful, Lord, that despite all my shortcomings and failures and and weaknesses as a a preacher, communicator, and person, Lord, that, that in all of it, your name is made great and glorified. God, I thank you that in our weakness, you are made strong. God, I pray that those who are far from you would come to know you and that you would use me as a herald of the good news of the gospel. God, I pray that you would continue to allow us to find ways to be the body of believers in the community that you've called us to be. God, we love you and we thank you so much for everything you've given us and everything you've blessed us with. God, we we thank you for all the times that you've said no in our lives. God, right now we pray that we would recognize you for who you are and not try and rebuild God in our own image so that we can control you, Lord, but just surrender and submit to King Jesus. Admit that we are sinners and that our heart is leading us astray and just believe in you for the forgiveness of our sins. Confess you as Lord and just go out and love the world because we love you so much and the human beings made in your image, we are gonna love them. God, we love you and we thank you for this time in your holy, precious name, amen. Amen. You guys, thank you so much just for joining us this morning. Um, Just want to remind you, so next week, try and find a place that you can set up. The weather looks good so far. Um, We'll see if it's going to rain, but if the weather's good, we're going to do service outside wherever you are, wherever we are on our little patio out here, Um, and just celebrate the resurrection of King Jesus together on Sunday morning, Easter, April 12th. It's going to be a great time. Um, Sunday best, right? I'm going to try and wear my suit. It's going to be great to get dressed up and then go on my patio. Um, But I want to encourage you guys to do the same and just really just make this an event and make it super special um, and and just make it all about Jesus. You guys, I love you so much. Be blessed and be a blessing. Uh, We'll see you on Wednesday night for Bible study if you're going to join us for that, uh, or we'll see you right here next Sunday at 1030 a.m. Love you guys.